Hello readers, welcome or welcome back. Today I'm going to be doing a requested read. So David H, this is for you. We're going to be doing The Charioteer by Mary Benolt, originally published in 1953. Before we do dive in, please note that we are going to be going into some heavy spoilers, including the end of the story. And I also want to give a trigger warning because some of the content of this book is graphic. So please do make sure you look into that before continuing the video. Without further ado, let's jump into the overview. The charioteer follows a young Englishman wounded in Dunkirk during World War II. During his stay in hospital, he is reconnected with a former classmate whom he greatly admired, and he meets a young Quaker man who is working as an orderly in the hospital. Our wounded Englishman develops romantic feelings towards both men and ultimately must choose between them. Let's go into the plot and the pacing. The story is written as a wartime romance. Our main character begins to reconcile with his queerness and recover from an injury which has permanently changed his way of living. Renault's elevated language and lengthy chapters make the pacing fairly slow for this read. Let's talk about the characters, starting with Laurie Spud Odell, our protagonist. We begin to follow Laurie with his father leaving, then we flash forward to school where he meets with his classmate slash prefect, Ralph, who is being expelled. After the expulsion, the story jumps forward again to Laurie's stay at the recovery hospital and the remainder of the novel takes place for the duration of his stay. Next, we have Ralph Lanyon. So Ralph was the prefect at Laurie's school and he's expelled for supposedly having relations with another boy at the school. To this news, initially Laurie is shocked and he attempts to rally his classmates to band together in protest of Ralph's expulsion. To this, Ralph meets with Laurie to talk him down and gifts him with Plato's Phaedrus, which concerns itself with love and outlines depictions of homosexual love. Laurie later learns that after school, Ralph was drafted into the Navy and was one of the Navy officers at Dunkirk who picked up Laurie and transported him to medical care, effectively saving his life. Ralph is much more entrenched into the gay subculture of England and has had numerous relationships with men and women. The next character is Andrew Raines, a young Quaker and conscientious objector to the war. Andrew works as an orderly in the hospital Lori is recovering in, and although Lori is discovering his homosexuality, he feels an immediate connection to Andrew, whom he worships as a beacon of innocence and goodness. Andrew hasn't completely come to terms with his own sexuality, but to do so would be to act against his religion, which in many ways is the entirety of his identity, and why he's objecting to this war. Next, we have Laurie's mom, whom Laurie uses as a crutch of sorts for the majority of his early life. When she ultimately decides to remarry, Laurie's perspective is forced to shift and he must make decisions about the kind of person he wants to be in comparison to the people in his life, like his family and his friends. And the last character I want to discuss is more so a group of characters, essentially Ralph's friend group. So primarily, they act as a foil against the purity depicted in Andrew. Ralph's friends make up stereotypical portrayals of gay men acting catty, jealous, and insecure. They're portrayed more as children acting off of impulse and emotion alone versus Andrew's more deeply reasoned and philosophical actions. This group of people serves a purpose of creating drama to advance the narrative, but Renault's thesis seems to be in support of this group as they are all contributing members to English society serving primarily in the armed forces or as doctors. Let's move to some of the themes present in The Charioteer. Firstly, we have The Charioteer itself. So what exactly does this exemplify? Well, it goes back to some of Plato's teachings within the Phaedrus, uh, the book that Laurie is gifted from Ralph. There's a passage within that book which Laurie reads throughout the text that's describing the charioteer, which is essentially the soul, and how the soul must learn to manage the two aspects of love, which are depicted as number one, the black horse representing the lustful side of love, 
and number two being the white horse representing the altruistic side of love. So essentially these two sides are represented by Ralph and Andrew individually. The second theme is the loss of innocence or a passing of culture and knowledge. So we see this from both Lori and Andrew, who is more so alluded to through the literal passing of Plato's book, which Ralph gave to Lori. At the end of the story, Lori gives this book to Andrew in hopes that he can learn about himself through reading of the text. There's a pretty consistent theme throughout the story of learning secrets and the more knowledge and growth that characters have within the story, the more pain they receive through this knowledge. So in some ways, the passing of knowledge leads in and of itself to a loss of innocence. The next theme I want to discuss is toxic relationships. So we see toxic relationships through almost every relationship depicted in the story, starting with Laurie and Andrew. Laurie places on Andrew a level of perfection that's impossible for any human to achieve. Lori knows that there could be no future with them without Andrew sacrificing so many parts of himself, such as his religion, his ideologies, his philosophies, all the things that drive him and make him the person whom Lori admires so much. Then we have Ralph. Ralph is depicted as somewhat abusive and alcoholic. After Lori ultimately cuts ties with Ralph at the end of the story, he learns that Ralph is planning his suicide to divert this, knowing that Lori no longer has a future with Andrew. Lori and Ralph begin a relationship, which is how the story ultimately ends. I have some pretty major issues with this theme because essentially Lori rejects Ralph in pursuit of Andrew. And then when he ultimately learns that Andrew would have to sacrifice so much of himself, he lashes out at Ralph for wrongdoings, which he falsely accuses Ralph of. And then feeling, feeling guilt goes to apologize, in which he discovers that Ralph is essentially planning his own death. And to, to, to avert this, Lori begins in a relationship with him. I mean, there's just so much wrong about this. Their relationship isn't really built on trust or truth. Even if Ralph didn't actually commit the acts that Laurie accused him of, and yes, they have a history together and they know one another since childhood, but ultimately Laurie chose Andrew. And to go back to Ralph after this, I mean, it's just, to me, there's no way that their relationship would have any chance of success in, in any sort of reality. And I think it's kind of just furthering this ideology of the shallowness and insecurity of gay people that if you're left or you're rejected, it the only logical solution would be to end your own life or hurt yourself. And we see this actually in Ralph's friends as well. So maybe that's where he's getting this ideology from, but essentially, all of his friends are in short-term relationships. They go to these kind of brothel-like parties. And several of the characters we actually see self-harming due to their true like mental instability and lack of trust in their relationships with one another. And the last relationship dynamic I want to discuss is Lori and his mother. So once we learn that she's planning to marry a man whom Lori detests, while yes, it does seem unclear if she truly loves this man either, it's ultimately her decision to be with him or not. And Lori essentially pushes it onto himself to instigate some sort of a fight or some sort of a breakup with them, which just kind of furthers this idea of his immaturity, not being able to accept others' decisions and ultimately be happy for his mom when she's cared for him alone through his entire upbringing up, up to now his early adulthood. Ultimately, in all of these situations, though, Renault seems to actually advocate for these kinds of relationship, alluding to Plato's ideas of a selfless love or sacrifice being needed in order for this kind of two-part relationship of the, the lust and the sacrifice, essentially. Particularly, she seems to advocate for Laurie and Ralph's relationship, despite the situation that led them ultimately together at the end of the story. Now let's go into some of the good and the bad elements of the charioteer. Firstly, as I think from my limited knowledge, we can probably always expect from Mary Renault, the writing is absolutely beautiful. 
phenomenal descriptive. The downside of that though is that sometimes it's so elevated that for me it made it clear to decipher plot points and I was really having to rely on subtext to understand what was happening, especially because at this time so many of our characters were speaking in really coded ways because we're dealing with a subculture of queerness in England during a wartime. So because of that, there, there were just so many elements that I was not really confident I was understanding until characters' reactions to them much later in the story. There were, however, some cultural references which I really enjoyed, particularly one reference to The Wizard of Oz. Quote, Someone turned up the radio. A brassy-lunged female sang of rainbows. Her vibrato was excruciating. So maybe we can take it that Renault, or in this case, Lori, isn't a huge fan of Judy Garland, but the reference is cute nonetheless. Another thing that I really liked within this story, and I think this more so closely aligns with Renault's personal beliefs and ideologies is her depiction of sexuality being non-linear and a general rejection of labeling. So a quote from the story is, he kept telling me I was queer and I'd never heard it called that before and I didn't like it. The word I mean, shutting you away, somehow ripping you off with a lot of people you don't feel much in common with, half in whom hate the other half anyway, and just keep together so that they can lean up against each other for support. That quote in and of itself is a bit of a cynical take in my opinion, but I do however appreciate that these characters are kind of rejecting a general labeling and questioning the need for blanket terms and everything. Obviously I think community in and of itself is nothing but a good positive thing and a community is essential for humanity. But however, the, the conversation more so about labeling specifically, I think is really interesting, especially during this time for her to be kind of talking about these kinds of ideas, even if we didn't have as much terminology as we do for, for instance, today, I think really more so she's just really like rejecting labels altogether and is more so expressing if you feel a certain way or you care about someone a certain way, that's all that really matters. And I think that's really interesting for a woman of her time to be kind of having these kinds of ideologies. To kind of connect to this point though, I think why some of these characters maybe don't like to be labeled or put into boxes or like they said, half the people hate the other half is because Renault's really giving some super negative stereotypical portrayals of both women and queer people. I feel like she's making the majority of them seem super unintelligent, dramatic, and immature. At least the people on the scene for the, the queers, maybe not so with Ralph or Lori or Andrew or some of the other queer people we meet, but a lot of Ralph's friends are described this way, and a lot of the women in Lori's life are kind of just bumbling fools. His mother, his aunt, some of the nurses in the hospital where he's working, just generally like not super great realistic depictions. And I found myself kind of thinking like, this author is super misogynistic. And then I was like, oh yeah, this is written by a woman. And I think I kind of alluded to this earlier, but just in general, I really didn't ultimately agree with a lot of the points that she's trying to express within the novel, I think specifically like the toxic relationships, how she's describing relationships. Obviously I wasn't alive during this time. I have no idea what it was like to be a gay person during the 1940s in England during the middle of a war. I'm sure it was so, so different than anything I can imagine, but it's more so about the, the people. People are people regardless of the time, regardless of the situation. And the way that, that people are depicted here as being so just unlikable made it kind of hard to get through and made it hard to stomach some of the relationships and made it hard to root for them because they're just not really likable. So to conclude with my final thoughts, in general, I'm still a huge fan of her writing. I think for me, this book was much less impressive than Fire From Heaven about Alexander the Great. I feel that the elevated writing style works much better in a setting which kind of lends itself to those 
mythological themes and ideas. Whereas in 1940s World War II England, it just made the book difficult to get through. I think that at some time this book was probably really revolutionary in its portrayal of queer men specifically, but I think we've moved past the need for these kinds of depictions. And if you're wanting to read this kind of historical romance, I would recommend Maurice instead. So that concludes my review of The Charioteer. As always, I would love to know your thoughts on both my thoughts and opinions that I shared today, as well as your own personal connections and feelings about this book. Also, if you feel that I misinterpreted anything, please let me know. Like I said, there were parts of this book that I really struggled to understand, so hopefully I didn't stray from the author's intended source material too much or make any really big blunders. I definitely appreciated this recommendation and I'm always happy to hear the titles that you all recommend to me, so it's super appreciated and I hope that my not liking a book doesn't deter you from commenting and, and leaving your thoughts because the thought is appreciated and we're all allowed to have our differing opinions on literature and that's what makes it art, right? It's, it's all subjective. So this is just my opinion. I would love to know yours. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you on the next one.